at Oxley that Sally mentioned, and so that's about 125 k's northwest of, of where we are here at Hay. And um, there's an aerial shot of where where we live, just after a, a shower of rain, which would be nice now. Um, on the map there, just that blue marker there, that's that's where we are. So we're sort of in the middle of, um, if there's a triangle between Val Ranald and Hay and Ivanhoe, broadly speaking, we're sort of in the middle there. And um, our country's open saltbush plains, so there's hardly any trees there, um, just an open landscape. And, and the saltbush is probably our main source of, of fodder for the sheep. And through the winter, we get clovers and that sort of thing growing there as well. But 12-inch um, rainfall, as I said, um, and it's quite variable. So it's, it's a difficult environment to um, run a grazing enterprise in. But um, like other producers in our area, that's part of the challenge. And everyone's got their different ways of being able to, to cope with that low rainfall. And probably the vari variability is the main thing. Uh, there we are, um, you can see there, that's just a map of, of our place. And I was just gonna talk a little bit about, when, when we first came um, 17 years ago, my wife and I bought Curra and Bluebush. It's a little bit messy there, but I've just sort of written on this map to um, make it a bit easier to understand. And so we've, over that time we've added neighbouring properties to just give us a bit more scale for our operation and make it a bit more efficient. And to do that, we've had to, to add in things like laneways and watering systems and that sort of thing. Water's a big thing. Um, I'm probably speaking a bit to the younger people here. The landholders today know all about this, but it, water is so important. There's no creeks or, or rivers or anything in, in our country, so the water that's there is either fallen from the sky into a dam or you've got to provide in a pipeline. There's, there's no other way for the stock to survive. So those, those eight different properties had their own watering system and a bore maybe. And so we've tried to link them together with um, joining the pipeline in, into sort of make a big web, I suppose. So if one bore breaks down in the middle of shearing, say at Fremount, then you've got the other bores, they're going into that same system. So it's all one system, basically. And um, we have telemetry, which most people probably heard of. But all that is, is monitoring the, the level of water in your tank. So if a tank is low, it'll go off on your phone and tell you that the, the level's low and you can Find, find the problem before it's a big problem because we can't go around. It takes 20 hours to, to go around and check the waters. That's without doing anything other than sweeping out trolls. So it's two, two full days for someone in a vehicle. And, and that would have to be done you know, every five days, otherwise you'd risk losing stock. But having, having that telemetry does mean that we can, we can do it less frequently. Uh, we went too far. So just showing you there, that's the laneway we've put in. Sally mentioned we uh, have put in a new wool shed, which is at, at Curra on the eastern end of the map. So the wool shed's actually up one end of the place. Um, before that, we were shearing at, at Bluebush. We had eight shearers there and six shearers at Oak Dean, which is down the, the southwestern uh, side of the map there. So we had two two teams essentially going at once and that was very difficult for us and the obvious inefficiencies there, we had two classes and two cooks and two mustering teams and and being an hour between the two sheds it was very hard to to manage and, and do a good job at both and at, and at the end of shearing you still would have sheep that needed to match up with other sheep up the other end of the place. So now um, we find it a lot easier having the wool shed in one place that's got the capacity to, to handle all the sheep. 
And at shearing time, that's the one time that all the sheep would go to the one point. So we try and set ourselves up for the year, you know, in terms of sales sheep or any cull sheep or anything you, you want to separate or, or join up with another mob, that would happen then while they're all together. And then they, they go out to, to back to their paddocks, of course. Um, all those yellow squares are, are the other sets of sheep yards where everything else can happen. So that's crutching and scanning, weaning, jetting, whatever we do happens in, the, in those yards further out. And most of them you can let the sheep back out, which makes it a lot easier than, than bringing them in. But having said that, we're only really bringing in five mobs of sheep each age group. So I guess um, you know, a couple of weeks before shearing, you'd start mustering further out and, and get an age group together into, into one paddock and then they can come in and same thing after, after shearing, they go back as a mob and then you, you split them up into their paddocks. Um, one thing I was going to talk about was the, you know, the, the challenges in, in the rangelands or the western divisions and probably the biggest thing for producers like myself would be the seasonal variability. You know, sometimes it doesn't take a lot of rain and then you've got a heap of feed. We, we all run at a pretty low stocking rate producers in, in the rangelands because of the nature of, of the rainfall and, and it doesn't always come when you expect it. And you can see there how good it can get. And then um, the picture on the right, it um, you know, can get fairly dry also. But um, we, we try and run the, the same number of sheep every year rather than, than um, you, you know, sell a heap of sheep when it's dry and, and um, try and buy back in a good season. So we, we join the same number of years year in, year out. And you can see there the lambs on the left in a tougher year and, and you know, they, they haven't grown well and a little bit harder to manage. And, and then in a better season, which doesn't take a lot, the lambs on, on the right, we'd, we'd like to have them like that every year if we could. And in, in order to, to keep running the same number each year, we, people would have heard of drought lots or containment area, pretty common. And in the last couple of years, we're, we're a big focus. We, we built this drought lot 15 years ago, and it's a pretty cheap setup, really. It's just hinge joint and a few trolls and, and next to a set of sheep yards. But we have self feeders in there and, and the idea of that for, for people not familiar with this sort of thing is to be able to put the stock or some of the stock in there when, when the, the ground cover is getting low and you want to protect your ground cover but also protect your sheep and keep them going forward in the condition that you want them to be in. So. Basically, everything that they consume is provided by us. There's nothing for them to eat in those pens. It's only 10 square metres per, per sheep. But we've found that a pretty valuable thing to have um, over the years, to, just to keep the numbers up. We don't want to be, get to, to good years and a good season and not have the stock to sell um, and to be not able to capitalise on, on good prices in good seasonal conditions. That's just basically a few feeders in one of the pens. So the sheep would be trail fed initially, pretty, pretty low cost sort of a setup. And then after two weeks induction, then they, they can eat straight out, out of the, the feeder there and help themselves to hay. So we're not actually mixing a ration. We put feedlot additive in with, with barley and it's pretty simple for us. Um, we breed our own rams. Um, we like to do that because we, we can measure the ones that do well on our country. Um, you know, it, it is a challenging environment at times and, and it's nice for us to know that the rams that, that we're selecting can do well on, on our particular country. You can see there we're, um, we're, we're fat depth scanning and eye muscle area measuring on the left in that, in that crate. And then those ram wieners on the right, we're just 
side sample them. So for those younger people that don't know what that is, we just take a, a piece of wool from the side of the sheep and it goes away to a lab for testing. These sort of things can, can help us choose which, which rams we um, feel are the best based on those measurements. And this is just fleece weighing in operation. So they're all electronic tagged and that's a stick reader there while the shear is shearing the sheep. You just just take a reading of the tag and that prints out that barcode which then is Bluetooth to the computer to, to measure the, the fleece weight to that animal. Um, that's the wool shed we talked about, some, some new weaners there lined up ready for shearing. It's, it's given us a lot more room for our click preparation. Um, having the new shed, we had um, quite a small shed before at Bluebush where we were shearing and um, it was built as a four stand shed and, and we had eight shearers in it and every bale that was pressed it was, had to roll out on the ground. Um, there, there just wasn't room in the shed to store any wool. So we're really um, appreciating having that extra room there. Um, at shearing time, we also um, go through all our ewes and um, we condition score everything. Um, so we put them up the race and we find it's quite a quick and, and cheap thing for us to do to try and in, improve our conception. So we probably end up in most times taking a bottom third or quarter lower in condition score and they will be separated from, from their mob and put to a better paddock or a lower stocking rate with the view to try and get their condition up before joining because they've probably only got another eight weeks after shearing for them to get their, their body condition up to get a good conception and they might be the ones that are a bit poor or could have reared twins or something like that and, and they may be our most productive sheep and we feel this is a pretty cheap way of, of looking after them and you may not necessarily have to feed them grain to get them up if, if there's enough paddock feed around they might just need a little bit more room or, or a better paddock. So that's what we do there and we also um, wet and dry at lamb marking so anything that that is scanned in lamb but doesn't rear a lamb then they get a notch in the back of the ear. So when we're conditioned scoring we'll anything that's got two notches if it's dropped a lamb twice then they're culled out of, out of the system just as a, as a way to try and as a few have talked about earlier to try and um, get the freeloaders out of the system I suppose we, we don't want to be running a breeding operation at running weathers. So yeah, the condition scoring is a pretty cheap and easy way of just trying to get to the next. That might be it, is it John, is it not? There we are. We've got one of a crutching trailer. Um, so as, as I said, all those other things can be done further out in, in the yards um, that are closer to the paddocks and the sheep don't have to come in into the to the wool shed for this sort of thing there they are just crutching on the trailer and um, pretty easy to pack that up and tail it around two other sets of yards. Uh, there um, wild goats or rangeland goats is, is another part of our business um, for those that sort of don't know much about, about goats and how it operates if they're on your property then they belong to you so the goats just go through fences, they can, they can hop over a fence or under or anything, they're, they're pretty clever at that. So we don't really breed the goats or, or they don't have our earmark in them or anything, they're just running in, in the western division or the rangelands and so when they're on your property then if you get them in and sell them that's, that's your income but if they go through to a neighbour's property then they're no longer yours even if they've been on your on your place. So that's pretty much how it works but we probably muster up a, a couple of thousand goats a year. So we do this four times, four times a year 
and um, they're pretty hard to, to handle at times. They you need pretty good dogs and, and we um, use a helicopter sometimes for this if, if there's a bit of timbered country they um, can take a bit of getting out. But those uh, goats are worth um, over nine dollars a kilo now so 30 years ago they were a pest and, and people used to shoot them to reduce the grazing pressure. And that's the other benefit there. If they're on our country they're eating our resource that we want for our own stock so it's a win-win you're getting them off and, and also getting a bit of income for it as well. Feral pests is another thing that we've got to contend with in the rangelands. Um, especially when we start doing a bit of feeding, you notice the, the pigs, they, they love a bit of grain and, and they seem to, to come in more so, but I think the pig numbers have increased in the, in the Western Division, particularly where we are in the last 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, it, it, it was sort of uncommon to see pigs, but they were about, but now, you know, we're seeing a lot more sort of larger mobs. So in that picture there, that's a bait station. So um, that fellow there has been, been putting grain in there and the pigs will come in every night for, for about 10 days and when you know they're, they're um, feeding on the grain, then you put the 1080 poison grain in and that's a pretty effective way of, of managing the pig population because they can take your lambs um, and, and you sort of don't really want want that I guess, that and foxes, so we bait for foxes as well. Um, that picture there I just took a couple of days ago, um, just to sort of end my talk, that's where we're at at the moment, um, got pretty dry again, uh, we would have loved to get a, a rain when they were talking about that good system that went through probably a month ago and they were talking about 90 mils or something would have been ideal. We hadn't dropped a lamb by that stage. Um, lucky the sheep have had a good run last year, so they've been in, in pretty good condition and they're able to lamb off the condition on, on their backs. But of course, the, the minute they're, they're lactating, then they lose condition rapidly. So it'll all depend on what happens, you know, over the next month, I guess, as to where we go to from here. But that's part of the challenge of of what we do and, and other producers like myself, it's um, nothing's ever straightforward or easy. So we might look at, at maybe weaning our lambs early into a feedlot, um, which we have done before, and that, that can work very well. Um, we did, in 2019 was a fairly dry year, and um, we, we said to the lamb, a lot of people weren't mulesing or marking their lambs for that reason and just didn't want to knock them around. And we said to our lamb marking contractor, just all those little potty fellas, just leave them in, in the catching pen till the end and, and we'll put them aside in, in another pen. So every pen, all the little fellas that um, weren't going so well, we put them aside, we took them back. We ended up with, with about 500 of these little fellas that went into a feedlot and um, we didn't mark them at all. Well, within about six weeks, I, I rang the lamb marking contractor and said, you better come back and mark these lambs because they're getting too big. And they ended up being bigger than the ones, we should have done it with, with all of them. So that was a bit of a learning, learning curve for us. In hindsight, it's a great thing, but in 2018, if we had have weaned them all, into a feedlot, then we would have been far better off because the ones that stayed on their mothers, they um, they'd sort of slipped more, and so had the ewes. So it's something we could look at if it if it doesn't rain in the next next month or six weeks, I, I guess. So that's pretty much it. I think that's just a another re reference map. Tell you what, if you haven't got a few questions now, you're all asleep. 
Yeah, Bill, thank you for a great presentation. A um, couple of questions about your containment area and your shearing. I presume you're shearing just before lambing or not long before lambing, just looking at those ewes. And have you joined in your containment area? We, we haven't um, joined in the containment area for our general joining, but what we have done in the past, uh, it was a few years ago, but after scanning, we put all the dries into the containment and joined them in there. Um, and there was two reasons why we did that. The first one was to, to relieve graze, grazing pressure. Um, we didn't really want the pregnant ewes in, in the containment area. And we thought if we take those dry ewes, they'll be easy to feed just on a, on a maintenance ration. And then we thought well, we'll join them in there as well. And that worked quite well. Um, because it did rain, uh, the other ewes that were pregnant had more space, but then we had this other drop of lambs from our dryers that, that we were able to keep. Thanks for that, really interesting. Um, just wanted to hear a bit more about weaning your lambs straight into a drought lot. What, what ration did you use with those 500 little potties? And how old were they? Yeah, well, they were probably only eight weeks old when we did that for those little fellas. And um, we put them onto, onto vetch hay and then we started them on, on pellets initially, the real little fellas, and, and that was a high protein pellet. And then they went on to, to a mix of lentils and barley uh, with a, a feedlot concentrate. And, and we kept the, the real little fellas on vetch hay um, that whole, whole time. And the, when they got a bit bigger, obviously, then they just went to straw, to barley straw. And then they um, still kept getting the, the barley and lentils ration. Thanks, Bill, for your presentation. Just a query on your telemetry. Um, I'm assuming you haven't got mobile service coverage across your whole property. What systems your telemetry run on? Yeah, well, we use Observant, Pete, but it it um, it talks. All the units talk to each other through UHF. So if they're within sort of five or ten k's of each other, they'll bounce a signal, and then we have one point where there's phone service, and that's all you need. So that one point is at the end is what transmits it to the cloud. Hey, g'day Bill. Um, those 500 lambs that you weaned early, what was the survival rate? And then at the end of it all, how did they measure up to the traditional weaned lambs, the ones that weren't weaned early? Yeah, the, the survival rate was pretty good with, with those. In that sort of a situation, you'll probably end up losing 1% over the time they're in the feedlot. Um, in terms of comparison, they were actually better than the, the ones that were left on their mothers for longer. It was a pretty tough season. We had a lot of frosts in that year and um, every time we'd get a break we'd get more frost and you probably remember it we, we just couldn't get going with any sort of feed so in hindsight like I was saying we would have been better off weaning them all early at that stage and, and looking after them properly in, in a feedlot but it often looks you know like you sort of see the, the dead ones like I was saying the one percent um, but you see every single sheep that dies in, in that sort of a situation, whereas, you know, in the paddock, if you had 500 lambs, you might not see any dead ones, and then you get them in and, and there's, you know, there's 20 dead, but you haven't seen one. So I suppose that's one advantage of you're in control, aren't you, in, in the feedlot. Um. I was wondering when you've been talking about doing the drought lot containment, um, for your system in particular, 
how long, say like on many years scale, so if we went through another severe drought or um, you had continued poor seasons, how long would practising a system like that be sustainable for your enterprise? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to read into the question maybe what you're asking, but if we had to feed all our sheep in there, is that what you're getting at, how, whether that's economical or not? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if it's something that you saw yourself having to do year in, year out, how long do you, could you see yourself being able to keep that practice as sustainable before it became? But I think, it, like, it's if you had all your stock in a feedlot and you didn't have any land and that's all you did, it wouldn't be profitable. But it is profitable if it means that you can maintain your numbers and get through to the next change in the season and then you're in production again because that's what we do. We, we're, we're a grazing operation in the Western Division so we've got to use the resources that are there and, and we're not a feedlot. So we're just trying to, to do that as a way of, of getting through those, those leaner times so that we have full production um, in the times when there is enough there. If that answers it, I hope. Yeah, yeah, no, Any more? Any more? Yep. So just back to your um, drought management and your feedlotting, when your supplementary feeds, were you, was that from any kind of reserve that you had stored over time or were you having to fork out money then and there as soon as the drought had happened to buy everything? And as well, you mentioned that you were using barley. Did you, do you crop at all or do you purchase again from an external source? Yeah, that, that's a good question. We, we don't do any cropping. Um, and that's pretty normal for most people in the rangelands. The, the climate's too dry for us to, to do any form of cropping. So we buy everything in. Yeah. And we tend not to store a lot of fodder um, in readiness for a drought. We just sort of do our, our sums on what's the, the best available source of energy at the time. Okay. And, and so we are at the mercy of of the price of the market on the day, yeah. I think you've done pretty well, Bill. For a bloke that's never done a PowerPoint before, but just before yeah. we just before we clap Bill off, just for the sake of the students in the room, you're very modest. How many breeding ewes? Uh, it's a sixteen thousand. Yeah. yeah, and how many hectares? Uh, Ninety thousand hectares. Yeah. Yeah. Do your calculations, students. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Well, Great. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker.